There is much debate over the subject of archery form, and while many different forms can be made to work, there are certain principles which make certain forms better than others. Here we will study some of these principles and use them to develop a best form. This is the basic position for which most archers strive, the classic parallelogram. It's a good sound posture and form, and it eliminates many of the classic problems, but it's still not perfect. In this theoretical position, the draw arm and the arrow are perfectly aligned. The problem is that very few people have arm and body dimensions that allow them to actually attain this position. Instead, most archers find themselves in a position more like this. It's close, but it has even more problems associated with it. These problems can all be assessed at three critical angles. Angle A, the angle at the bow hand between the bow arm and the arrow, or line of force. Angle B, the angle at the bow shoulder between the bow arm and the shoulder line. And angle C, the angle at the string knocking point between the draw arm and the arrow, or line of force. To make things even worse, many archers get a little lazy and end up with a slightly open stance, such as this. Here, all the critical angles increase, and the archer's form has even greater problems. Let's talk about the static balance of the archer, these angles, and why they are so critical. When an archer stands at full draw, there is a load applied to his body by the bow. This load is applied at two points, the bow hand at the grip and the draw hand at the string. The archer must hold these loads and balance them in a statically stable posture. We all like to believe that all of the loads are handled skeletally and that we have reduced the variable muscular activity to a minimum. But for archers in the classic stance, this is simply not the case. All angles greater than zero degrees either cause or require adverse lateral loading at these points. These adverse loads require moments about other joints. In all cases, the greater the angle, the greater the adverse load, and the more significant the muscular variability. Let's analyze this by starting at angle A, the angle at the bow hand. Here, the bow imparts a load on the bow hand at the grip. Most of this load is taken directly and compressively straight into the bow arm, bone into bone, right into the shoulder. Unfortunately, there must be an angle at A to allow for string and arrow clearance. This angle causes an offset load that wants to pull the bow arm forward. This offset load must be countered by a moment about the bow shoulder. This moment is maintained by back tension. These muscles must hold the load back at a full arm's length, so even a small load can present a fatiguing and highly variable effort. Angle B at the bow shoulder is even more critical because of the complexity of the shoulder joint. The bow shoulder must handle two loads, the moment required to resist the adverse lateral load at the bow hand, and the direct compressive forces transferred from the bow hand through the bow arm. These compressive forces are applied directly to the shoulder, but not all of the load is taken directly and compressively into the shoulder girdle. Here, the angle between the bow arm and the shoulder line determines what portion of the load is taken into the shoulder girdle in a stable manner and what portion is taken laterally. The greater the angle, the greater the lateral loading. This lateral loading will try to push the shoulder out of line and must be resisted muscularly. Angle C at the draw hand is critical not only because of the static loading balance, but also because of the complexity that it adds to the release. Holding the hand in against the chin creates an angle between the draw arm and the arrow. This force can only be applied by a moment about the draw elbow, and this requires bicep tension. The problem continues at the draw wrist. The moment created by the biceps is applied to the forearm. If the wrist is kept relaxed, then it bends awkwardly. Keeping the wrist straight requires a moment about the wrist, and this requires tension in the inner forearm. Here again, 
We like to believe that we are working with a relaxed forearm, but the laws of statics tell us that this is impossible. If angle C is reduced to zero degrees, then the lateral force is no longer required and both of these moments are eliminated. Only then can the muscular activity of the bow arm be reduced to its minimum. The greater complication caused by angle C has to do with the release. With these complex and varying moments and loads, there is much muscular activity which must be coordinated in order to produce a smooth and consistent release. In addition, the angle naturally wants to pull the draw hand to the side. This can also cause a release variability. Any lateral pull on the release can cause a wide variation in the release. The best release condition possible is to pull the draw hand straight back with as simple of a muscular action as possible and without the need for any coordinated muscular activity. This enables the smoothest and most consistent release possible. Now that we know all about these angles and the need to minimize them, let's talk about how we can accomplish this. Let's start by getting out of the comfortable open stance and getting serious. By rolling the body back about the bow shoulder, the archer can arrive at a neutral parallelogram stance. From this point, many archers work to eliminate angle C by moving the head back or going to a side anchor. While this can reduce angle C to almost zero degrees, Archers often find that their draw arm is rotated so far back that there is little range left for aft motion at full draw. This makes it very difficult to come through the clicker. Instead, if the archer continues to rotate his body back about the bow shoulder, he obtains a dual benefit. Not only can he bring angle B at the bow shoulder down to zero degrees, but as angle B is reduced, so is angle C at the draw hand. Once the archer is rotated back to an open position far enough to reduce angle B to zero degrees, he can often adjust his head and anchor to fully eliminate angle C also. From this position, the only angle left is angle A. The archer must slowly squeeze this angle down until it is only as large as is necessary for proper clearance. At this point, all angles are either zero or at a minimum. All adverse loads and moments are either eliminated or at a minimum also. This is the most statically stable position. This is the best position for a true straight back release. This is the position for which the archer should strive. This is the wedge.